Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Unit Lost. I am Stylosa and Jeff Kaplan has done a Reddit Ask Me Anything, which is kind of like a Q&A session on Reddit. And I was gutted that I missed this, but it was a very impromptu thing. He just sort of did it yesterday because, well, why not? You see, I would have liked to ask him a simple question. Does rank really matter? It would have been a beautiful question. Anyway, let's see what people actually asked him and let's see what this actually tells us about Overwatch and about Jeff himself. So let's get stuck into this. Who is your favourite hero? This is going to sound canned, but I fall in love with a different hero each week. I think that's one of my favourite parts about Overwatch. I totally get maining and I have heroes I play more than others, but I am constantly discovering new things about different heroes on different maps. And then of course, their backstories, etc. Also, every time Hanamura comes up, I will only play Hanzo on defence because roleplay meet me on the porch Genji. Oh god, no. Please, please don't play Hanzo on defence, Jeff. What? Anyway, moving on. Apart from Overwatch, what is your favourite game to play? Right now, Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's a masterpiece. Well, if it's good enough for Dad, it's good enough to me. I'm off to buy a Switch. Oh, Lord. What stories do you have that you can share from the initial development of Overwatch? The first hero we implemented was Tracer. We did not have any animations or gun models, so she shot laser beams from her eyes. Uh, I would pay to see that, and that needs to be a skin. <laughs> Jeff, what is your favourite map? Thanks for doing this. I love Hanamura, I know the players don't, but I love that map. I love Eichenwald and Dorado for the height differences and flanking routes. I love Nepal because of the hero mix required to successfully play all three points. Same with Li Zhang, really. Well, I like Li Zhang and Nepal, that's beautiful. I also like Dorado and Eichenwald is pretty good, apart from the first point, but we'll get onto that in a second. So Jeff likes verticality and flanking routes in maps. I think I do, and I think we all do. Beautiful. You said you fall in love with a different hero each week, and so don't have a favourite. But do you have a favourite hero ability out of all? Not necessarily one that you think is the most powerful or has the most utility, but the one you think is the most fun. Reinhardt's charge, and yes, I know I'm not supposed to use it. That's right, Jeff. Don't charge like a crazy person. The whole team will die. Well played. You often say that you play the game yourself too, and you included comp, so when communicating, do you avoid using voice chat so they don't know it's you, or don't you care if they notice you? It's a real bummer because I used to use voice chat quite a bit, and no one recognised me, but lately it's gotten to the point where I can't use voice anymore. They say, you sound just like Jeff Kaplan, and I say, who's that? I'm very much a communicator, and I like to shock call when I play, so not being able to use voice really bums me out. This is kind of like, I can relate to this, because when I play, well, when I talk, people go, you sound like that YouTuber, or that guy, and it's every game, and it's, yeah. Yeah, a victim of your own sort of, well, success, I guess. I don't write code. I so wish I knew how to write code. If I could go back in time, I would have learned a few languages. I wrote basic on the TRS-80, and that's it, lol. I spend more time helping with the game design philosophy and providing direction for how we should prioritise the team's time. I try to build a vision that's based on what the team wants to create and then help spread that vision, communicate it to keep everyone to it. It's easy with this team because they are so high-functioning and don't even need me. I mean, I'm sitting here writing on Reddit in the middle of the day, lol. <laughs> hey Jeff, ever thought about an in-client tournament system like StarCraft 2 or Dota 2 have? We would love to make a system like this. A system like this is extremely hard to make and very time consuming from a development standpoint and also reaches a very low percentage of players, but it's been on our list for a long time, hopefully someday. Now actually, I was part of a uh, sort of a panel at BlizzCon where we discussed this and this is one of the features that we wanted to add to the game. So it'd be interesting if they do this. I think it would be awesome. Hmm, we'll have to wait and see. Have you ever thought of a little co-op mode in a seasonal event? I would like to fight with friends side by side in the Omnic Crisis or to infiltrate Volsky Industries with Sombra, Widow and Reaper. We loved making Junkenstein's Revenge, we'd love to make more. I hope to god they are making more. I, I cannot see a future, an Overwatch future that doesn't include PvE content ladies and gentlemen. It's gonna come and it's gonna be absolutely beautiful when it happens and I cannot wait for it because Junkenstein's Revenge, that was the best seasonal event by far, it was awesome. Can you talk about the hero development like their old abilities? The hero who had the most changes was Bastion. We used to tease that Bastion had the ultimate of the week. He had grenades, he had a remote mine, he could shoot through walls. Yes, Bastion could shoot through walls. He had an artillery volley. We just never could get it right. We were really pleased with the tank though. Transforming into another form really fit the character. It was way more work than any of the other abilities, but it was worth it. Yes, and if Bastion could fire through the wall, that would be disgusting. <laughs> Remember when Bastion had a shield as well? That was also absolutely disgusting. Bastion, a very interesting character, and also he's voiced by Chris Metzen as well. Do you like playing competitive Overwatch, and what rank range are you in? Do you care? You should totally have asked him, Deb Fee, if rank matters. <laughs> anyway, this is what Jeff says. I love playing all aspects of Overwatch except for play versus AI. We want to evolve play versus AI, but it's not a focus, and it has a long way to go, so come on PvE content. 
I like competitive a lot. I am a platinum player. I think I could get diamond maybe if I played comp more. I tend to place at the start of a season and play 25 to 50 games past that and then go back to quick play arcade. I've been playing a decent amount this season. I placed around 2,700. Most comp games are fun because people play smarter, tend to care more and cooperate. I really wish people wouldn't tilt so much or tilt so hard in team chat. I understand how frustrating the game can be when things aren't going your way, but I wish people would stop for a second and not say that mean thing in team chat. It doesn't do anyone any good. Everyone always looks to us to solve the toxicity problem with some magical game design fix, one that has not yet been invented by any online game thus far. Anonymity does weird things to humanity, I fear, for the zombie apocalypse. It is true, like, toxicity is always an issue, and we've just got to become better players ourselves, and I think over time it will probably get a little bit better. But very interesting, Jeff's a platinum player. Titan was started around 2007. I just remember we were working on the Burning Crusade at the time. It was in development until May of 2013. Titan was a class-based shooter MMO, and one of the classes was called the Jumper. The Jumper wasn't a specific character, but rather an avatar like Warrior in WoW. Most of the concepts of the Jumper were male. We did some female ones as well. The playable version in the game was male. Blink, Recall and Pulse Bomb were all designed for the Jumper, as well as dual wielding machine pistols. At the time I was playing tons of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and my loadout was the M16 primary with G18 secondary. The Jumper guns were my G18s. But because Titan was an MMO, the Jumper started to get tons of progression abilities, you know covering a whole level up system, so the Jumper got shotguns and knockbacks etc. It was very cluttered and confused. We then simplified for Overwatch. We chose only the abilities that worked well together and then created a hero rather than a class. Tracer had a personality, an origin, etc. That's what made her work. Contrary to popular belief, most of the heroes in Overwatch were not in Titan. Tracer had elements of the Jumper. Reaper was Reaper. He did have a crossbow at one point in Titan. Widowmaker evolved from a class called the Ranger. Bastion also evolved from the Ranger. Soldier 76 evolved from the Ranger. Symmetra and Torbjorn evolved from the Architect. Reinhardt evolved from the Juggernaut, although he's completely different. Different. just had the idea of a big guy with a shield uh, is all that stuck and Genji Hanzo evolved from the assassin so that is very uh, that is that is the most information I've ever seen about Titan um, like naming the characters in their Titan variants and like how they came to Overwatch very interesting that was in fact that was probably one of the most interesting comments that I've read uh, in the entire ask me anything because like there's not that much info about Titan so any info on it is well it's really fun to read so on the topic of how they nerf and balance heroes, this is what Jeff has to say. I always describe our approach as the triangle. I feel like there are three key factors that guide us. The players, statistics, and us, our own feelings as players. It's very rare that all three of these factors align. Often, we have to ignore one or two and make a change. I think the overhaul to Symmetra was a good example. According to the stats, she was fine, but both the players and we agreed that she felt underwhelming. We made changes to make her more fun to play in spite of the stats telling us that she was fine. Honestly, the same thing for Bastion recently. We play the game a lot, we play on live all the time, and we play internal builds of the game constantly. We are always trying big changes to heroes internally. Lots of these never see the light of day or PTR. Honestly, we can't win on the PTR. If we make big changes and they go live, we get heat for it. If we make big changes and pull them back, we get heat for it. We have to just trust our own instincts at this point and our own mistakes when they happen. The play behavior on PTR is not super helpful for balancing. Average play time of those who log in is usually around 16 minutes. Most of the time, someone logs in, they want to try the changed hero and logs out. People don't play traditional comps and they just want to try changed heroes. If they don't get the hero, they leave the match. And they, uh, you have people who have less than 20 minutes playtime in a hero, testing that hero on the PTR and then giving feedback based off one match. Historically, the balanced feedback has been very unreliable from the PTR. It's still good to hear how people react and what their perception is, but the reality of quality matches doesn't happen too often in a test environment. Internally, we have a competitive play test that's helpful to get good feedback from Diamond Plus players who work here. We're also very fortunate that the pro players will often invite us to watch some scrims on PTR. None of this is perfect, but we try hard to listen to feedback and keep the game balanced. See, this is the thing, like, when I play on PTR, I play quite a lot on PTR before I make the videos that I make. I don't just play one game. The problem is a lot of people just play one game and have, like, a knee-jerk reaction to what's going on, like, oh, this hero's bad, this hero's that, etc., etc., etc. Obviously, I can do this as well, and it kind of happens to everyone, and this is why we only really get balanced testing when these patches hit live. So I think that's very interesting, especially the sort of internal team, um, Diamond Plus team that they've got that test, which is just obviously Blizzard employees and watching some pro gamers scrim as well that's a good idea 
We have an entire business intelligence group here at Blizzard and they're amazing. I know the name sounds scary and corporate, but in addition to providing our business guys with analytics, they work with the design team very closely to look at everything. Heroes, maps, matchmaking, progression items, unlocks, queue times, game mode, popularity and trends. The best part about the BI group is that, they're hard, is that they are hardcore players of the game. We often use ourselves as guinea pigs for analysis or testing. We look up our own accounts and see what's going on. It's a lot of fun to look at the data, but you also need to have an idea of why you're looking at it and what you're trying to accomplish with it. For example, we try to keep all maps balanced as closely to 50-50 win rate as possible. Icon Volders never achieve 50-50, but players love the map. We made changes to the door and we have one more round of changes coming to the first choke. These are largely driven by the stats showing us the imbalance, but left to our own feelings, we love the map and feels like one of our best. It does, but we need another route around the first choke and hopefully that's what they're going to do, which could be a huge change. So go on, Blitz. Let's do it. The Iconvolve balance stats warranted a change. Hero pick rates are tricky, sometimes they warrant change. Right now, we're trying some stuff with Lucio. We feel like a lot of players feel like he is a must-have in comps, but also don't he doesn't feel like he's super impactful to play. We're trying some ideas to make him more engaging to play while making him a little less obvious must-pick. We'll see if those changes make it to the PTR. One tricky thing is that a player's perception of must-pick doesn't match actual behavior. I sometimes look at the hero pick stats and they clearly don't match the hero meta report stats. Then people, then players tell me to throw out my stats and, and only look at diamond and higher in competitive play. Well, at that point, I'm not sure players realize what a small percentage of the player base they are asking me to make a decision based on. Obviously, we're in the process of toning down Anna right now, but we're also not out to see her get never played ever again. Player reaction is often to sledgehammer ever everything. This is kind of true, right? But the interesting thing here is uh, Lucio. What are they going to do to Lucio? Maybe get rid of his auras? I don't know. Maybe make him do more damage? Well, I don't know. This could be interesting because Lucio is a really fun character to play, but you often feel like you're just wall riding around and not really doing anything. I mean, you are. You're speed boosting and you're like healing the team and you've got the sound barrier, but he doesn't feel that great to play, especially compared to the other supports, I don't think. So could be some interesting changes for Lucio. I guess in a way similar to the Symmetra sort of changes. Gonna be interesting to see. Why doesn't Blizzard provide more complete stats? Is it a philosophical design issue not wanting to give users too much info that Blizzard itself doesn't have many of the stats? or that there are simply aren't systems yet built to properly share that data, since programming a system to share stats might be low on priorities. Edit. Thank you so much for coming and answering my question, or well, the questions. Our stats aren't 100% reliable and up to date, not at the point that we would feel comfortable making them public facing. We're always working to polish and improve them. We'll keep looking for ways to share more information, but we also want to be careful because not everyone can be objective when it comes to looking at stats. For example, there will always be a most picked and least picked hero, and that doesn't mean the game is broken. You see, this is the thing, right? If you give people stats, if you say, Mercy is the most played hero. I mean, Jeff has done this himself on the forums. I think he said, um, Mercy was like one of the most played supports or something like that at some point. And people were like, you must be joking me. Like, we never see Mercy. Like, Mercy's terrible. You read the meta reports and it's like, oh, Mercy's never seen. Thing is though, meta reports from places like Overbuff and if you watch the pro gamers, well, that's like ultra high level. Like, Mercy is a, a very like common character that's played. So that's an example where the stats kind of don't match up. But I think that's very interesting. And it also shows you like hesitation at Blizzard. I don't think are ever going to give us complete stats. Like, they would never do that. I think that just would be a bit of a crazy bit business decision like on the whole. What do you think of all the Dino Flash videos? What do the other devs think of them? He is super talented. The videos are hilarious. Obviously, I feel embarrassed when I see them. I mean, I'm this middle-aged awkward nerd with naught points in charisma, and I really don't belong on camera in any way, shape, or form. But if I look at the videos objectively, like if they were of anyone but me, they're hilarious. I always say that Dino Flask says what I wish I could really say. <laughs> are you sure, Jeff? Are you sure about that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been um, a breakdown of some of the best questions that I, I noticed on the uh, Reddit Ask Me Anything that Jeff did. Now, this wasn't planned, and I'm kind of a bit sad it wasn't planned, because I, li I would have liked to have asked some questions myself. Um, but, you know, there you go, whatever. These, as I say, were the best questions taken from that, um, which happened yesterday, and it just sort of happened like... I, Jeff obviously just decided to make a Reddit account and start answering these questions, because he says he does actually read Reddit quite a lot. Like, I, you know, we have to be... It's a bit extreme to say we need to be thankful, right? But we've got a development team around Overwatch that is very open and you can clearly see that they enjoy playing games themselves and they really like to talk to the community and they're not afraid of talking to the community, which is a huge thing. If you look at other games, they don't have this. Like, this is a very unique sort of thing to, to 
well, I guess to Blizzard in a way, but Overwatch is taking it to sort of the next level. Like the whole team that Jeff's got in place, you'll notice a lot of them are very open. When I met some of them at BlizzCon, it was the same sort of thing. They're not like faceless people. They're actually people that play the game, and it's really fun to talk to them. So yeah, I thought this would be a fun video, and 